see you guys are just talking to a camera. So just kind of make sure. Um, uh, welcome. Welcome to the stream. This is uh, one of many. Uh, this is uh, doing the impossible task of doing sensory, practical sensory training uh, online. And uh, we will figure out, we'll, we'll figure out a good way to do this. Um, today we're gonna we're gonna be talking about the basics. We're gonna talk about. Um, I'll give you guys a little intro of myself. What it is that I do here at Siebel, Um I'm a brewer by trade. I've been I've been brewing production uh, for about 11 years. I am I've been leading sensory training now uh, here at Siebel for about three and a half years. And I'm also training practical microbiome, and I'm currently the product manager and uh, recruiter for Siebel Institute of Technology. Okay, I, uh, I also went to Siebel. I am a WBA International Diploma alumni. That was about seven years ago. It was something that changed uh, 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 my life, my professional life in, uh, in many, many ways. And that opened a lot of doors for, uh, for my career. Uh, let me open up my presentation here just for the sake of references. So, sensory training. I'm gonna talk about a few learning points we're gonna be covering. Uh, uh, senses, all of our sensory instruments that can be used as instruments. Sensory analysis is, is an important quality control tool you need consistent, continuous training, and you need to do it in a, uh, you need the right procedure, okay? We're gonna be exploring essential flavor compounds. Um, and let's talk about flavor compounds first and foremost, because definition and language when it comes to sensory training is absolutely, absolutely important. Um, it's actually more about language than anything else. It's more about establishing the standard language in, into how we're gonna communicate about something that you're gonna taste, that I'm gonna taste. Uh, the definition of off flavor has changed quite a bit. What's an off flavor for me, for my brewery, let's say hypothetically I own a brewery and I, uh, there's a certain flavor compound that I don't want in my beer, well, that's an off flavor to me, but that same compound may not be an off flavor to you. So we're trying to redefine what it is an off flavor and try to not say off flavor and rather use the word flavor compound. Okay. So then again, on the definition of of flavor, right? We're gonna start with the basics. So what is flavor? People. People tend to um, sound is waving oddly. Okay, it may be something I'm getting getting a wavy sound. Uh, uh, I'm just gonna keep going and, and see if that changes. You guys, let me know. Um, so let's talk about the definition, uh, the definition of flavor. People tend to mix, mix up a little bit what the definition of flavor. So flavor is a combination of things. Flavor is taste plus aroma plus tactile sensation plus your sight. It's a combination of everything. Okay? That makes up flavor. Taste. Taste are the basic ones. Tastes are the ones that we can taste in our tongue. Sweet, salty, bitter, umami, and sour. Well, let's talk about those for a second because they exist for a reason. Right? Let's start with sweet. Sweet is um, is the raw taste of energy. We crave we crave uh, we crave sweet quite a bit, um, especially when we're kids. You know, sweet is the raw taste of pure energy. And if you do not use up all the energy, your body's gonna go its fat. 
Salty, salty is very important. Salty regulates a lot of our bodily fluids. Bitter, bitter is a funky one. Uh, we are ingrained to be very suspicious about bitter. However, you can, it's an acquired taste. If you have, people we would use that a lot, acquired taste. We acquire a taste for it. Bitter, in terms of survival, it's equal to poison. Uh, we're taught by, by our ancestors, our hunters and gatherers, that if you find something bitter out in the wild, it's probably gonna kill you. Uh, but if you, if you learn that it's not gonna kill you, you can learn how to like it, such as coffee. Uh, coffee obviously helps. Uh, sour, is a, sour is another funky one. Uh, we crave uh, sour things, uh, primarily, let's say a, a citrus fruit, you know, your body knows, it's ingrained and knows that you're gonna get essential vitamins like vitamin C, but Acids found, acids found in the uh, car batteries will likely, most likely kill you. Some people don't like uh, vinegar, which it contains acetic acid, which is basically uh, uh, oxidized ethyl alcohol. And um, lost my train of thought here. Uh, some some people don't like uh, vinegar or, or sour things, but I personally love sour. Some people like it, some people don't. Sometimes you crave it. Uh, we have to be aware of, uh, of, of sour. And umami, uh, we talk a lot about umami. Umami is the taste of the raw protein. We also crave that, it's the, the meaty, um, savory taste. There are others that taste that are being included in the, uh, in a taste wheel. Um, I'm just gonna keep going. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, on the next, on the next uh, 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 sensory session, I'll uh, I'll get this audio fixed up for me. For us. Okay. Um, Aroma and predispositions. A lot of the, a lot of the flavor. What do you make up? Make up a flavor. At the end of the day, it's going to be more related to aroma and a combination of everything, but primarily aroma and what you taste in your mouth. Um, and 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 the retronasal, what what it comes back afterwards, right? So it's uh, uh, it's the complexity, the differences into how things taste and how you perceive them is more related to to the aroma um, and your predisposition. So on how something smells, uh, uh, a big question that I ask uh, the students is, does it taste like it smells? Does it smell like it tastes? Something that you should ask yourself every time that you're gonna drink a beer, I ask myself, because I don't know, I guess I'm, <laughs> I'm a nerd. Uh, does it taste like it smells? Another, another little cool experiment that you could do is to get a jelly bean put it in your mouth, close your nose, chew on it, swallow. Now, the only thing that you're gonna perceive is taste, the taste is sweet, you let it go, and all of a sudden you're presented with whatever flavor that jelly bean was. Uh, sensory evaluation, a sensory analyst is considered the instrument. We, um, at the end of the day, uh, we, as brewers and as people in the industry, we can get quite technical in the subject. We can be very, very technical. But at the end of the day, what matters is whether it tastes good or bad, right? And we, as humans, are very good at determine, determining whether it's going to taste good or bad, or if it tastes good or bad. We talk about compounds, we talk about the chemistry makeup of the beer, of, of those compounds that makes up the beer. But at the end of the day, a machine is not gonna be, you're not gonna be sending the, uh, the beer through a machine and it's gonna tell you what it tastes. So those are the humans are gonna be tasting the beer or judging whether it's good or bad. So 
that's that's the importance of of the human element into quality control, into sensory analysis. And at the end of the day, there should be someone there tasting the beer before it goes out to the market. Your individual experiences, the things that you tasted in your life in the present, in a, in a past, are going to account a lot. How many things, what you know, what certain things taste like, that's going to count a lot. Your cultural bias. I grew up in Brazil, for example, in northeast part of Brazil. There are fruits out there that I could not even begin to uh, uh, describe to you what it tastes like. And in describing fruits, that's an exercise that I that I uh, do a lot with uh, with my students is describe to me what, an, what a strawberry tastes like. Well, strawberry tastes sweet, sour, and, it, and I, I, found, I find that it's very hard to describe what a strawberry tastes like because it, at this point, it's the standard. You know, we actually associate a lot of things to strawberry because at, at society indicates that at this point in my life, I had to have had strawberry at least once. So that's when language becomes very, very important. If your cultural bias, your experience, the things that you experience in your life and the things that you taste in your life. Uh, your personal taste. Maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, but if you're tasting the beer professionally, if you're on a panel and if you're doing, if you're a part of a, a, a quality control, you should leave your personal taste behind. I, I have a lot of, I have a few things. I, I, I worked in the kitchen before, I do cook quite a bit. And there's a lot of things I, I eat and I don't, I just like very little things, but let's say beets. Beets to me taste like earth, it tastes like dirt. It's very, very unpleasant. Uh, but I know some people that like it. When you're, when you're doing professional, beer tasting and you're doing this, either you're judging or you're part of a sensory, a, a, a continuous sensory panel for your brewery, you have to leave your taste, personal taste behind. That's what defines you as, as a professional. Language, as I said before, establishing the language, it's more about language than anything else. Also, understanding the flavor compound too. It's much, it's much like language, I, I associate picking up a flavor compound or pick, picking up a new flavor compound that you couldn't pick up before, much, it's very like adding a word to your vocabulary, right? All of a sudden, when, you're, when you learn a new word, all of a sudden you start to hear it everywhere, on the bus, on the train, on the car, on the TV. Uh, same with flavor compounds, you, you don't know what you're looking for. Now, beer is very complex, about a thousand Odors. I hate using the word odors. I, I like the, the word aroma. Uh, the word odor makes me, makes me think about B.O. So it is very, uh, it's very much about language and it's very much about your senses and your memory. Your practice, the memory, your knowledge of compounds. And just knowing the textbook definition of what the compound should taste like is, uh, It's not, it, it's just not enough. You, it, it, sometimes a textbook definition may not be how you perceive that certain flavor compound. All of your senses, all of your senses are, are utilized to react to characters present in beer, to measure, to analyze, to interpret. And there is primarily subjectiveness and the objectiveness of the subject, meaning that the concentration of the compound in that beer is one thing. How you perceive it, it's a whole different thing, right? So that's what makes it non-exact. And that's what makes it very biased, right? So, and the concentration too is something very, very interesting. Something in smaller concentrations, same compound in smaller concentrations could represent one thing, same compound in higher concentrations can represent a completely different thing. I'll give you an example. Butyric acid. Butyric acid is a very, very interesting one. Interesting one. If you guys here uh, on this line, the slides, if you, who recognize, who knows what butyric acid is, it's something that in beer, primarily, it's definitely not desirable. 
not not desirable at all. Uh, butyric acid producing bacteria are present in the husks of malt. If you basically let you mash sour, you almost one hundred percent sure you're going to have loads and loads of butyric acid. However, butyric acid in higher concentrations in different products could mean something completely different. Butyric acid makes up a lot of the Cheetos character, and it gives that cheesiness, that, that weird cheesy character. So that goes to show how concentration really, really makes up a difference. Um, what what is sensory used? What, what do we use sensory analysis as a quality control tool? How can we better use having, making a better use of, of having a sensory program in your brewery. Define the flavor profile in beer, right? Monitor unwanted flavor compounds. Product consistency, that's a big one. Uh, there is some beers in the market. There are some beers on the market that have considerably changed over the years, and those are perceivable changes. Whether it was wanted or unwanted, I I don't know. But if it's if it's if you want those those flavors to change, that's your decision. But if you don't want it and you end up having different flavor profiles of that of that product, that's a problem. So product consistency, you can use good data and and good practices to ensure that the beer tastes. <clears throat> Validation of the brewing process and ingredient changes. Ingredient changes are a very possible scenario, especially especially in days like this, like 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 they sometimes. Uh, uh, and despite despite what we live, how we're living nowadays, it's very easy to for you to run out of something important that makes up the flavor profile of the beer. I was working for a brewery and we could not, we did not have a caramel malt. It was a crystal malt that we didn't have. Um, and we tried a swapping with something fairly similar, but it ended up being very, very, very different. So how can you, how can you make sure that whatever changes you're going to make to your beer, the impact are going to be as minimal as possible if that's what you want. So sensory analysis is here for this. You understand it and actually tasting the way that you should be tasting the beer to make those decisions yourself. That's how you do it. Exact methods and data evaluation. As I said before, and I tell my students too all the time, what's the difference between science and screwing around? It's taking notes. And guess what? Taking notes is a pain in the butt. Take, taking notes is not fun, hence it's a job, but it's necessary if you want to keep the pattern going. And continuous training. I'm sure you guys saw uh, that there is a uh, beer here uh, uh, behind me, and I'm taking this opportunity to, to, to taste myself, to do, I picked out some compounds that I haven't had in a while, so it's very important that you keep on doing. You keep doing the same training over and over and over again. We're going to now move on to the uh, practicality of the subject. I'm going to show you guys our latest sensory tool here at Siebel. And as I said, today we're going to be exploring the uh, essential uh, sensory kit, you know, the little box like this. When you open up, you're gonna be seeing samples, just like this one. Okay. Why liquid? You see, so we have liquid flavor compounds. What liquid is a very, very uh, um, accurate way to spike the flavor with that flavor compound. That we're talking about. Okay. So on the, on the uh, essential flavor compound, okay. I'm going to share my slide here. 
That's the first one. Okay. This particular compound is a combination of two things, acetic acid and diacetyl. Okay. You can take a look at the, uh, at the concentrations there. Okay. We have uh, 0 0.6 parts per million of diacetyl and 360 parts per million of acetic acid. Okay. The threshold you start the, the, the average human start detecting diacetyl at about 0.1 to 0.2 parts per million. Okay. And acetic acid between 60 and 120 parts per million. Okay. So notice that it's quite high. It's about three times the average human threshold, which is contained on this impulse. This impel is one milliliter and it will dose a liter of beer. I'll quickly demonstrate you how to prepare the sample. Okay. Right here, I have a pitcher that will easily fit in about a liter of liquid. I'm going to crack a bottle of beer open. This is 330 ml. Budweiser. We here at Siebel, we do use Budweiser. Budweiser is a uh, standard American lager. It's a balanced beer and it's a very good beer to spike all flavors in. Those all flavors that come in, when they spike, they, they come out, they come out very very strong, so it's a good beer to to use it as a standard. That's why you use it. So I put the contents of the whole bottle of beer on this pitcher. Here I have the impel. I'm going to carefully break it. Break it. Make sure you always have paper towel right next to you because I also have recommend you to use gloves. This is highly, highly concentrated. You can easily spill this on your fingers and it's gonna smell quite a bit. You carefully break it and you dispense on the pitcher, okay? Now make sure too that sometimes when the impulse travels, Make sure that the, all the contents are in the bottom, on this bottom of the impulse. Sometimes they uh, they stay up here, and uh, when you break it, it's a mess. So in order to mix up well, you just Fill up the rest of it. Now, when we do the spike, when we do the spike of the beers, it's very important. They establish a control. The on the non uh, uh, spiked version of it. Your first step is to understand how the beer tastes like without being spiked. Okay. So in this case, the book wider. You inspect everything from color to clarity, appearance in general, foam formation. Some of those spikes they tend to. Uh, either enhance the foam or kill the foam of the beer. So appearance, you look for cloudy, uh, you look for clarity, you look for foam formation, you take your notes, this looks like strogamy, I don't perceive any turbidity. Then you assess the aroma. You want, you want to become familiar with this beer, so to me, Early multi.
greenish. I don't pick up any oxidation, which is a good thing for me. I'm very sensitive to oxidation. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about oxidation. It's fairly fresh. And you go for the taste and the dry for nasal. So overall, a fairly fresh beer. Fresh sample of Budweiser. Um, it tastes like beer. No, uh, Palo Balances is not a leader. I put three bottles in there. Uh, so close to a liter, 990 ml of, uh, of beer went into that jar. Okay. So let's talk about this, the first, this first uh, uh, flavor compound that I'm sharing here with you guys. Contamination. This is, this is a compound to simulate contam what contamination is going to be like. Contam contamination by what? In this case, primarily Pediococcus. Uh, Pediococcus is a bacteria that produces both diacetyl and uh, lactic acid. On this, on, this, on this example here, you're seeing acetic acid, which is basically uh, it's produced by acetobacter, uh, but it does, it does emulate quite well. Just lactic acid doesn't give that impact. Uh, uh, and it's usually, if it's contaminated, you're also going to have uh, uh, some acetic acid character in there too. Pediococcus uh, contaminated uh, uh, some beer lines, right? So it's very important, very important that you that you clean your beer your lines periodically. It's every time you take every time you change your keg, and or every two weeks. Okay, very very important. What happens is if you don't clean your uh, your lines, you have a high a high chance possibility can, to have a bacterial contamination, primarily Pediococcus. And if if that beer is flowing, if you have a flow, uh, if that beer is flowing all the time, you may not perceive this issue. But if as soon as it stops, the lines are coated with bacteria. Bacteria is going to produce uh, uh, pediococcus. Pediococcus is going to produce uh, diacetyl, and then you're going to taste it. On the next fight, you're going to taste it. Yeah, that's. I'm looking at the chat. I'm looking at the uh, the comments here. Yeah, because it's liquid. It's a. It's very. It's very difficult to ship out. Or it can be very difficult, depending on on the country, to ship out our uh, our uh, our flavor compounds. So that that could be an issue, but uh, not impossible. Okay. So contamination. I'm going to go ahead and pour me a little sample. This is pretty much all you need to do the sensory. You're looking at uh, about 80 to 100 ml. Okay. So we're going to expect color. I don't see any changes compared to, compared to my control. You always go back to your control. That Your control should be a reset when you're going through. A, a large uh, 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 sample of spice. Okay, so color didn't change much. I don't think it changed much the the foam either. So let's, yeah, can definitely pick up the uh, the acetic acid and the uh, the diacetyl. Yep, definitely not pleasant. That's absolutely not pleasant. Um, a little bit about diacetyl too, uh, that I that I do like to talk about. Um, and I think that a lot of people, I, I feel like a lot of people in the industry throw diacetyl a lot as if it was a very a, a common thing. Well, it is fairly common. It's produced by yeast. 
and it's uh, primarily clock yield when it's general use or real use Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it's very related, correlated to flocculation. Why? Well, yeast produces diacetyl, but also reabsorbs diacetyl. Okay? If you have yeast suspension, you're going to carry out, you're going to make sure that all the diacetyl gets reabsorbed. Now, if you have a yeast that flocculates prematurely or, or, or flocculates too much, which is the case of a lot of British, uh, uh, highly flocculating yeasts tend to leave behind more diacetyl. That's one of many correlations of, of why you're going to have uh, diacetyl in beer. And diacetyl is, is perceived as buttery, butterscotch, uh, caramel. Caramel, make, make up of caramel is, uh, there's a lot of butter in it, but, but like the, the butter flavor of popcorn is diacetyl, okay? Now, is butter flavor bad? I don't think so. I love butter. I put butter, I cook with butter at the, uh, from post every day. Is it, is it particularly bad? Uh, no. But in beer, not my favorite. Absolutely not. And I'm fairly, I'm fairly sensitive. I, I'm actually across the board. I'm not hyper sensitive to flavor compounds, and, but I'm not blind to them either. So I think I'm just average. I can detect, I can see that it's there. Maybe, maybe because of my training, maybe because I, I, I know what I'm looking for, but I can easily detect it. That may be very different from you, but don't let that discourage you. What's the difference between a German Shepherd, who is your pet, and the German Shepherd who's in, uh, that is in the, uh, the airport sniffing for drugs. Well, one is trained, the other one is not. Okay, I got a couple of questions here that I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to end this. Does all flavor change the mouse view to slippery? Uh, Fairly, yes, it's, and I think it's more, it's more about how you perceive than anything else. You perceive as being, as being fairly, uh, fairly slippery. Does the, uh, does the, this off flavor kit do the same? I don't understand that question. If you wanna, um, elaborate that question. Oh, well, that, here you go, that's the answer below, okay. Let's uh, let's move on to the next one, DMS. Let's talk a little bit about it. So demethyl sulfide. Demethyl sulfide is a big one. Uh, the general, you can take a look at the uh, the concentrations. We're talking about parts per billion now, 400 parts per billion. So it's fairly uh, it's fairly more detectable to the human nose than diacetyl. Thresholding beer, you start detecting uh, 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 DMS between 25 and 50 parts per million, which is quite, it's quite low. Um, but it's very impressive that we can detect parts per billion, you know, and pick up, yep, uh, that's DMS right there. But if you ever visit a brewery, well, I'm assuming the people there are watching uh, this live right now are either uh, people in the industry or, uh, the majority uh, uh, are people from the industry, uh, maybe all of them. But the DMS is that general brewery smell because the the primary the primary uh, 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 smell that we can smell miles away from the brewery is during the boil when you boil and you work. And for those who ever, for those that, that work in a brewery, and if you have a condenser, if you grab a little bit of, of that water that's being condensated out of the kettle, and you sniff that out, that, that's pure DMS. DMS is what's being volatilized out of the kettle. And what, is it, what does it come from? Well, it comes from a precursor found in malt, okay? SMM. That's the acronym for uh, uh, for the compound. Lighter, the lighter the grain, the more precursors you're gonna have to the uh, uh, of DMS you're gonna have, and 
That's why it's important. If you don't wish to have EMS in your beer, you want to be very efficient. You want to have a good boil. You want to have a quick knockout. You want to get rid of that wort as fast as possible. Because what happens is when you're done boiling, you're still converting. If you're not volatilizing and the wort's hot, you're still converting the SMM into DMS. And you need to be, you need to have a, a good lauder and you need to you need to have a, an efficient boil and you need to get the DMS, that get the wort to the fermenter as fast as possible, as efficient as possible. And now, how do you perceive DMS? Textbook is cooked corn or cooked vegetables. And to me, to me, it's exactly what it tastes like. Some, some of the textbook, uh, uh, some of the textbook definitions to compounds, I, I don't perceive it as being, as being the same, but DMS is one, it's one of them. It's absolutely, so here, here I already had it dosed a while ago. And again, this is, uh, I already went back to my control. This is DMS. This is Budweiser with uh, DMS, about three times the threshold. Color didn't change much. I got the control right here. Color didn't change much. Foam formation still, still fairly okay. Aroma. It's just like opening a can of corn. I love cream corn. Is it? Is it unpleasant though? I wouldn't say so. Does it belong in beer? I don't think so. Not to me, at least. And in lower in lower uh, concentrations, it may be desirable. Uh, in in low concentrations, lower than this, this is a little bit too much. It can be perceived differently. It can be pleasant, but that's that's you who's going to dictate whether it's not flavor. Again, whether it's not flavor or not, what whether it's not flavor or not, it's up to you. To me, this concentration, yeah, absolutely. Does it taste like it smells? Not quite. It's late. It tastes, it tastes, the, the corn comes in a little bit late. When you first swallow, retronasal comes in. It's not as, uh, it's not as strong. Okay. Well, temperature, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, the, the, the start of the formation, formation uh, and conversion from uh, SMM to uh, DMS is about, it starts at 80 degrees Celsius. That's when we start getting that conversion. So you're, you have to go through the heat exchanger to, to go uh, as fast as possible and that, and you don't get too much conversion. But about about 80 degrees Celsius is when you start getting that conversion. If I remember correctly from uh, the Kunze book. Uh, shellfish, yeah, shellfish and vegetal, uh, vegetal. It's very uh, very shellfish-like. I agree with that. Something that I didn't think before. Shellfish, empty mass. Okay. Move on to just by acetal. Um, let's see how it compares to our previous one. Just by acetal. Okay. Collagen didn't change much. Form formation still the same. Aroma. Now, you know, and then, and then I didn't mention too much about the technique on how you approach the beer. Uh, there is a better procedure. There, there is a better method when it comes to, to uh, uh, smelling as much as possible. The sample. 
you, you should refrain, you know, the, uh, the net, I'm going to set the simple down. I'm going to grab my control. Everybody is very used to doing the, uh, put the whole nose in and doing like a long draw. A long draw. This is actually not as efficient as, as if you do short, sharp snips. Think of a dog when he's smelling something out in the wild. The short sharp is the bursts of of uh, of those compounds, those volatiles. They help you with every to understand if you really get the whole character of the beer. The short sharp snips. Refrain yourself from doing the long draw and slowly bring in the sample. Drive by, short snips. That really gives you a lot more than the drunk long draw. Back to diastro. Yeah, after after the uh, after the control, it's even more more pronounced. So diastro to me too, it, it almost wants it makes me taste sweeter, even though sweet, salty, sour, they don't have a smell. They are taste. They don't have a smell by themselves. Um, but it's something that's it, it, if caramel, if caramel is sweet, you're going to say it smells sweet. But remember that any taste don't have smell. So it's almost as if it's, it smells sweeter. It's, then again, language and semantics. Uh, what about taste? Does it taste like it smells? Into my face. Also, I'm doing the face. I'm being very very uh, uh, using all my expressions. We should also refrain from, uh, especially if you're in a professional setup, refrain from uh, giving any any biased opinion until until you ask for. Uh, you should not inter interfere with anybody else's uh, opinion because it does. If you say something, if you if you if your face does something, you're gonna predispose somebody else into tasting. Okay, uh, so we we covered we covered the acid a little bit. We talked about its origins. It is it's it's produced by a lot, by a lot of bacteria. It's produced by yeast. It's absorbed by yeast, but it's directly correlated with flocculation. If you have a beer, uh, uh, there is if you have a, a yeast that tends to stay in suspension a little bit longer, it will definitely help. And to reabsorb that uh, that uh, the diacetyl, also a uh, beer that has not been matured properly, that also tends to have more diacetyl. Uh, wild yeasts, uh, retinomyces, other types of yeasts tends to produce more or less diacetyl. So, but when we talk about the, the standard, uh, uh, we're talking about flocculation. Okay. Cool. I'm reading all of you guys' uh, comments, by the way. So any any questions or any uh, comments, please. Um, yeah, Urquell, I'm reading here. Uh, Urquell does exhibit uh, some. So Bohemian Pilsners may not. Uh, yeah, uh, Urquell. I've been to I've been to the brewery. Uh, one thing that uh, actually no, let me let me save that story for for another for another flavor compound. Let's move on with the uh, isovaleric acid. I'm gonna go back to my control. And what's interesting too is that Budweiser, after you're going through the spike, if you dislike some of those compounds, especially if you dislike some of those compounds, the Budweiser ends up, ends up tasting a lot better. A lot, a lot better. So, okay. Isovaleric acid. This is pretty much all you're going to need. Take a look at the concentration there six parts per million compared to uh, DMS is a lot higher. The threshold makes a lot higher. 
uh, starts at uh, 1 ppm, one part per million. And it's perceived as cheesy and uh, absolutely is. Uh, um, and again, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a cheese fanatic. I absolutely love cheese. Uh, but in beer, to me, it would definitely be a not flavor. Uh, it didn't change much on the color. It did not change much on the foam. What about the aroma? It's very familiar in a lot of ways. It's again, it's a little bit perfumey, but it's a little bit like an old, dirty bath rock, uh with uh, damp socks and cheesy, very cheesy. Oxidized hops tend tend to uh, uh, not tend, oxidized hops will definitely impact this flavor profile on your beer. A rock for cheese, very 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 cheesy. Now, you guys may know that ultra oxidized hops is used in a lot of Belgian beers. I do not know in what point this becomes of having having old hops, very ultra degraded hops becomes positive in a beer. That's the only case that I would see uh, uh, as being beneficial using old hops, right? But uh, on, the, on the case of using hops, if the hops have not been stored properly, if, uh, uh, yeah, oxidized hops in general, and I think, I think, uh, I know that as far as shelf life goes, if you're still using, if you're still using a, a whole cone or, or a flower instead of pellets, those guys, they tend to oxidize a lot faster than pellets. Something to keep in mind. Yep, does it taste like it smells? It tastes, it tastes 10 times stronger, 10 times stronger than, uh, to me, that's an arbitrary number, but it tastes a lot stronger than what it smells like. Very sensitive to this particular compound, okay? Uh, Mateo, Mateo here is uh, asking the question, may I tell Larry uh, as it be produced, may I tell Larry uh, as it be produced by letting a hobby beer be in the open or is it just in a matter of production? Well, um, it's related to production, it's related to prior to using those hops. I would look into that. I actually don't know the answer to that question uh, too well. I'm, you wouldn't have hot matter to make that happen post production. Okay, yep. moving on. The answer may be like butter flavor property. It's actually not made, it's absolutely, absolutely, yes, it is. Uh, uh, butter flavor. That's exactly what they use on on, on the flavoring of the of the, uh, the popcorn. Okay, moving on to papery. Talk about oxidized beers, uh, and I think prior to the prior to the uh, uh, craft brewery rev uh, uh, revolution and. Uh, most people started drinking imported beers. Beer does not travel too well. Um, you you have you have to handle handle it very very carefully in order to in order to, to withstand the overseas. And and then once once you you succeed at that, you also have to make sure that the beer stays 
properly stored, make sure that it's to be sitting on the shelf, make sure that it's being rotated properly. Uh, that's, those are all the challenges of, of having uh, a retail store. In Chicago, we have the Binnies, and uh, they have a very big selection. And it's tough when you deal with so many different labels to keep to keep the beer to keep to keep it rotated properly. And I when I when I say imported beers, and a lot of people are familiar with the oxidized. I know that a lot of people are familiar with oxidized uh, the oxidized character. We when I talk about the papery, if you read here, the product of uh, uh, oxidation, this papery, the one that we have here on the envelope, the papery, it is, it's when a beer is oxidized, it's not just papery. A lot of things os oxidize the beer. I tend to, my, 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 the best way that I can describe oxidized beer, it's an overall staleness, but primarily, an enhanced multi character. It's like the beer all of a sudden got maltier and it does get darker too. When the beer is oxidated, oxidized, oxidized, it does get darker. Okay? But overall, it's again, it's almost as, as if the beer got sweeter. It's, you get, you get this, oh, it, it smells sweeter. But this overall staleness, it's all the, the changing color. Uh, not just the papery, not just the cardboard. The papery is the textbook definition. Uh, but uh, but also the this overall staleness. Okay. So let's let's move on. Let's move on to papery. Let's move on to papery. Color didn't change much. Clarity didn't change much. This is almost as if there was more foam than my control. Maybe it could have been just because I just poured and the beer is a little bit warmer. Aroma, it's like grabbing the fresh book and doing like this. You know, when you flip the pages of the book and you just smell, it's pure paper. Pure, pure paper. Yep. Um, does it taste like it smells? Absolutely, it does. It's it's identical almost. You taste in what you're smelling. Um, but then again, this is this is synthetic, and uh, this it's a big chunk. The papery, the cardboardy character of oxidized beer, it's a big chunk of it, but it's not all. Uh, just remember, you're gonna encounter that overall. Enhanced, enhanced multi character in a beer. Okay. And then the sixth flavor compound in the essential one is the H two S. Hydrogen sulfide. Again, a lot of a lot of foam on this one. Aroma. If you guys are familiar with this one, uh, we and then all all the sulfur compounds are going to be are going to be fairly low. We are very, very, very sensitive. We, us humans are very sensitive to uh, to sulfur compounds. We tend to be at least sensitive to sulfur compounds. This is seven, 72, 72 parts per billion. Remember, DMS was 400 parts per billion. We're looking at seven, 72 parts per billion. This is fairly low in concentration, and I can tell you that it's very, very, very strong. So H2S is present in cellar. So that comes to the, uh, when, when we went to uh, Pelican Urkel, uh, 
we had a chance to go to the tunnels where uh, all the sellers logger uh, uh, H2S is that general seller smell. You know, uh, a, a lot of loggers carry, they, they tend to produce a lot of uh, uh, H2S. But one beautiful thing about uh, uh, sulfur compounds is that they're, they're very, very volatile. If you end up with, uh, with uh, H2S, for example, in a beer, a, a detectable amount, you can scrub it out using CO2. You can scrub most of it out. Uh, those, those sulfur compounds are very, very volatile. But H2S, it's rotten eggs. It's eggy, eggy in general, a, a, a boiled, hard boiled egg. You know, people I do like the hard boiled egg. Is it pleasant in the beer? Is it supposed to be here? And those concentrations, absolutely not. Does it taste like it smells? No, no, it's actually not unpleasant at all when it when it's when it comes to retronasal. That's one of the, the the biggest example on a, a a spike that does not taste like it smells. It smells bad, but the. Uh, uh, the retronasal, the aftertaste, it's, it's quite pleasant. Okay. Uh, another, another, uh, I, during the, during this whole quarantine thing, I had to, uh, I think us brewers, two people that stay at home is like, okay, so I want to, I want to homebrew again. I want to, you know, I, I want to do all those types of projects, things that I, that I, that I haven't done in, in years. And I, uh, made cider. At home too, and I also noticed that uh, cider had a lot of uh, H2O, especially especially when it's young. And I bought other ciders on the market, and I and I picked, I started picking out so uh, H2O and a lot of ciders, which is interesting. I, I never picked that up before until I grew, I, I made cider at home myself, and uh, uh, and I started noticing that it's a fairly fairly common common uh, uh, flavor makeup of ciders. Okay, um, so that's uh, that's what makes up our uh, 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 essential health flavor kit. We will we will be covering the next. We're going to be doing more of those live events. We're going to be covering the specific areas of brewery. We're going to be covering brew house fermentation packaging. Uh, we're going to be covering different types of panels. Um, we're going to be teaching, we're going to be teaching you how to, how to understand whether you are sensitive or blind and how that's important in the professional world, which is very, very, very important. You want to be a part of, of, uh, of a panel that you know you're gonna be, you're gonna be valued, and that 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 you can, if they're looking for, and in this example, H2S, they want to know if you can detect uh, sulfur compounds. Some people can be blind to it, or some people just don't know, and that's that's what I think a lot of the cases that sometimes we just don't know. Like my little story of detecting H2S and ciders. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of the places you just don't know. You have to, you have to do trainings. You have to uh, uh, know the textbook information. You have to feel how you associate with that flavor compound. And, the, and, and that's important because at the end of the day, just remember, at the end of the day, humans are going to be tasting the beer. You know, not a machine. Us brewers, we like to get very technical. Oh, just, just do a. a just do a uh, gas chromatography. Let's look at the spikes of the flavor compounds. See in the paper what makes up the beer. But at the end of the day, we're not machines, and we perceive it differently. And there are a lot of different. We can be biased or biased towards towards uh, uh, how you feel about a beer. Okay, I'm gonna look at the chat here. Uh, thank you, Amelia. Good lecture. No problem. Uh, would the slides be able to view online anywhere? Well, it can be, not this point in particular. We, this is the first of many. Uh, this is us trying out. I'm sorry that the audio sucked in the, 
in the beginning of it. Uh, we're gonna try to fix it. Maybe maybe it's the echo. Maybe it's where I'm at. Maybe it's my gear. But we'll uh, we'll make it better. Okay. Uh, and we'll consider we'll consider re, uh, uh, we'll consider recording as well. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks, Scotty. Scotty here saying hello. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, and uh, let's be. Um, we will be more uh, uh, engaged in the next uh, following lectures here. Okay. I'm gonna sign off. It will be on YouTube soon, Natalie Anderson says. Okay, so I was being recorded this whole time without knowing. <laughs> Great. No, amazing. Connor, good stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Next time. Next time. Probably this month still. Cheers, guys. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.